As somebody who's been coming to Comic-Con for many years, this is pretty exciting. I'm also excited because I was an invited guest this year. So it's like I'm a vampire, and now that they've invited me in, like, oh. <laughs> yay. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. I, I don't know how to follow that. And I also, I, do, I, they told me I had to introduce Lee and Aaron, but I feel like you guys know who they are. <laughs> I mean, introduce Aaron the Awesome. The Aaron magical Morgan's Aaron Morgan. Yes! <laughs> Author of The Night Circus and the upcoming Starless Sea, which I'm very excited and about. I haven't been to Comic-Con since 2011, and I forgot what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome I, back. It's a lot. <laughs> and I'm Petra Mayer from NPR Books. Uh, I get to talk to people like this for a living, which is pretty great. <laughs> so, I just I wanted to tell Aaron a short story about when I read The Night Circus. So it took me many years to read The Night Circus, and the reason is um, I first picked it up when I was drafting Siege and Storm, my second book. And I'm like, oh, I have, I have received this beautiful book. I'll start to read it. And I started reading and I literally threw it across the room <laughs> like it was a possessed object because I was like, this is too beautiful. Uh, <laughs> And I honestly emailed my agent, and I was like, I don't think I should do this anymore. And she was like, you'll be fine. That's not her first draft. Just keep yeah. going. But it, only years later, was I would like, I will pick up the hallowed object and read the book. So thank you for a beautiful I'm, story. I'm flattered, and I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I don't forgive you, but it's OK. OK. So one of the things that I love about this kind of event is that I get to ask my nerdy obsessive questions. And what I love is world building. And both of you have built these just amazingly tactile, sensuous worlds. Like I read your books and I can feel the, the silk of a kefta and I can taste the caramel popcorn at the night circus. How do you build these worlds? What's your process? What's important to you? You start. <laughs> I'll start. Yeah. Any more Kleenex? No, I can I'm talk good. about it. Okay. Um, I always start with, I have a place in my head. And before I have a plot, before I have characters, I have a place and I need to figure out how I take this sprawling space in my head and make it into a narrative. And um, the way I go about trying to describe the place is always like, if I was taking you on a walking tour of the space in my head, how would I describe it to you? Like, that's how the second person uh, sections of the Night Circus mm -hmm. started. Like, because if you were trying to describe the circus to someone, you would say it in second person. Like, you walk through here, you go through this, you smell this. And I love that you also describe how things smell, because not enough people describe how things smell. And I think it's really evocative to have, like, both, um, like, scent or light. I studied lighting design in college, so I always kind of think of, like, how is this room lit? which considering Starless Sea, most things are underground. I'm just like, how many ways can I say dark? <laughs> <laughs> this is a challenge I'm familiar with, actually. <laughs> um, I, I actually kind of begin in, in a, it depends on the book. Mm -hmm. Because with the Grisha verse, I really begin with the plot and with some sort of fundamental questions that had kept me up at night. What if darkness was a place? And mm -hmm. um, why would you ever enter a dark territory? And what kind of monsters would live there? And why would they look the way they looked? And how would you fight them? Um, and you know, coming up with the idea of taking a country that had, you say a country's been torn apart, well, literally tearing a country apart. Um, and then the world, in some ways, was the second part of that. And for me, there's, for the reader, there's establishing the sense of power, how power works in the world, the power that exists in a government, in a city, in a small town, between people sitting on a panel, um, within their family, within their workplace, within their school, and then the sense of place, which is smell and touch mm -hmm. and sight. And I feel like only when those two things really start influencing each other do I have a compelling world. With the Ninth House, I was starting with the Yale University campus, but I was also, I was writing the Yale I knew, the, the, the dark Yale, the secret Yale, the Yale I wanted to be real. Like, when you find out what the secret societies are really like, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> So I was like, no, I'm going to make it the darkest, strangest thing I can imagine. Like, really secret societies. Do really, it, right? the secret, secret societies. Yes. Yeah. Man, my college didn't have any secret societies. I think we had some or underground frat. Frat. Well, we had some underground <laughs> frat. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. The radio station was pretty covert. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is making me think about that this, the quote that George R. R. Martin always says, which is that some authors are gardeners and some authors are architects in terms of story development. You sometimes some people just plant seeds and see what co see what comes up, and some people have blueprints and they've planned everything out. So. 
Does that seem like a reasonable dichotomy to you? And if so, where do you fit in that, in that plan? I'm like architects, gardeners, and demolition experts. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm a little bit of a mix. When it comes to plot, I'm absolutely an architect. I can't write without an outline, um, unless I'm working on a short story, which is a different process. I have to know the way the story ends, even if that evolves and changes. It was one of the things, I didn't write a book for a very long time. I would start, I would lose steam, and that was because I didn't understand that I was somebody who needed structure to work. And you may not, you know, I sometimes feel like we often talk about process because we believe that there's some magical formula that will spare us the pain of writing a book. No. There is no formula. <laughs> <laughs> the suffering is what makes it good. Um, so that you know, understanding that there was going to be many stages of discomfort, accepting the fact that I was somebody who had to revise extensively, those were the things that made it possible for me to write a book. When it comes to the world, I think I'm much more of a gardener. And I was very relieved. I'm a big George R. R. Martin fan. I'm a member of his fan club. Um, <laughs> I'm Sarah Lee the second. I've been knighted. Anyway, um, so when I heard him speak and say that the only words for Dothraki, which he calls Dothraki. Um, <laughs> Does he also say Jif instead of Jif? Oh, Gif? God, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to know. Never meet your heroes. <laughs> so I, I felt when he said the only words in Dothraki before they built the language for the show with David Peterson, um, who's also building the languages for Shadow and Bone. Um, yes! <laughs> that he only had the words he needed on the page, I felt this tremendous sigh of relief because I felt like such a fraud in not being a Tolkien who had built everything before I began. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very similar in certain ways. I think gardeners and architects both sound like they know what they're doing. <laughs> like, whereas I'm just kind of like, I'll write and see what happens. And I always kind of start with the world and then I, try to find my way through it and I'm such a rewriter and I think I think you sometimes have this impression before you're really writing when you're a reader because I was always a reader that like the words look so pretty and organized on the page and you can't and, like imagine that they were ever anything but what they are like you can't really see the process behind it that like a, like a messy sort of yeah. I have a theater a theater background so like you know that like theater things are rehearsed and like uh, dances are choreographed and like um, paintings went through the sketch Pages, but I think when you look at a book, it's hard to like imagine the like the messy process that went on yeah. behind the scenes. And then when I allowed myself to be messy with it, is when I started getting better. But I, I am not an outliner. I am a super duper pantser, which is why it takes me a really long time to write things because I have to write it wrong like eight times before I'm just like, oh, this is how this story goes. I probably. The Night Circus was rewritten almost from scratch many, many times. Sometimes people ask, like, how extensive were the revisions? And I'm just like, see how the book has, like, 500 pages? Maybe rewrite every word on 400 of those pages. Wow. And that's, like, sort of where it was. Like, um, my example is always uh, Celia is not in my first draft. Oh. And she's okay. the protagonist. I you, what's the big <laughs> oh, like, so, How does yeah. that work? <laughs> it was just atmosphere and no plot. And I sent it to literary agents when it was still all atmosphere and no plot because I didn't know any better. <laughs> Don't do that. Have a plot. <laughs> it helps. Plot. I feel like I would read those 500 pages of atmosphere. I'm like, sure no they're problem. interesting. It would be like delicious. Um, yeah, I mean, I... I think for me, I, I just have a tremendous respect for that confidence because I don't think I had the confidence to believe that there would be a book at the end if I just mm. kept writing. Um, I think that I always sort of had a first and second chapter and then I would keep revising that first and mm -hmm. second chapter, but I had no idea what came after. And I was unable to sort of push myself forward. But I also believe that people who are pantsers, who fly by the seat of their pants, for those who don't know the term, yeah. it's not like we just throw our underwear around. Yeah. <laughs> um, or though maybe no judgment. It depends. Yeah. Um, but that they have an internal story meter, mm -hmm. like that they sense those story beats without having to necessarily see them. Sometimes I feel like I don't want to think too much about what I'm doing because like there's the bit at the beginning of The Magicians by Lev Grossman where Quentin like does the like fancy card trick and then can't do it afterwards and I kind of feel like that was what the night circus was. <laughs> like I, I don't know how I did that. Yeah, but Quentin's a jerk and you're not. Yeah. <laughs> 
And having read a big chunk of The Starless Sea, I had to put it aside because I'm drafting right now. And I was right. like, no more Again. of this beauty. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can reproduce the yeah. magic trick. You're good. I think it was that thing where like, I had to do it differently. And I had to let it be its own thing and not try to do like Night Circus Redux and like, just kind of sit alone with it. Sorry to take over, but I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> so like you do my job the easier No, I'm just curious about if you can quantify how it was different in terms of your approach mm. or even the way the story arrived or I think it was different because when I was writing the Night Circus at first, I wasn't even like thinking about publication. Like I, I started doing National Novel Writing Month because I would be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. I would not, I would literally not be here were it not for National Novel Writing Month because I would do that thing you just reminded me of the, like I would write a page and I would hate it. So I would stop writing. And that's not the way to be a writer. You have to write another page and another page. And National Novel Writing Month, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a like online-based challenge to write 50,000 words in 30 days, which is a lot of words and not a lot of days. So I didn't have time to hate the page. I had to write the next page and the next page and the next page. And at the end of it, I had a couple pages that I actually kind of liked. Yeah. And like that's what got me in that writing and quantity. And then when like, I'm doing drafting mode, I just kind of do that thing where I keep going. Same. And sometimes I end up somewhere I should not be at all because I just <laughs> picked a direction and that was not the right direction for the story. And then I have all those pages that need to go away. And then I need to go back to where I was and pick another direction and go that way. So it would probably help me if I was more of an outliner. Yeah. But I do tend to just like, I just keep writing and writing and writing and see. Like, it's like, um, I think going back to the Gardner architect, I kind of excavate. I just keep digging. Mm -hmm. And I think with something like National Novel Writing Month, you find things at the 30,000 word mark that you wouldn't right. have found at the 10,000 word mark and so on. Yeah, yeah. This is also fascinating to me because I don't have the fiction writing gear in my head. So I'm really? like, Ooh, tell me how the magic works. But I have a question <laughs> for you, which is you said for a long time you couldn't push past the first two chapters. So yeah. what got you over that barrier? Honestly, it was applying screenwriting structure. Mm. Like it was understanding the three-act structure. And now I, I love story structure and it's called breaking story when you sit down with somebody and you break out the beats of their story. Like if I could just do that with people all day, I would be not work on my own books. I would be... <laughs> I would be delighted. It's one of the reasons I love the chance to go on a retreat with other authors because I, when you are deep in the page, you can't see how to solve the problem. And then you start talking to someone, and even if their fixes or ideas don't, aren't, aren't the fix, they spark your brain and they free up the part of your mind that has just become completely paralyzed. So um, for me, I think unlocking that process and applying it to writing a book was huge because... I'd had, when I had the idea for Shadow and Bone, I honestly wasn't like, let's write. I was like, why bother? You know, I've started so many books before. I've never finished. Why would this be any different? You're not a writer. And at the time, I was in my 30s, and, you know, there's this kind of idea that if you don't do the thing you're meant to do really early, that you're not meant to do it, you know? And our culture really fetishizes youth mm -hmm. and the idea of the wunderkind and this, you know, oh, I discovered this young writer and I made her into a, a you know, whatever. So I imagine just somebody pulling puppet strings somewhere. But, um, you know, this is an idea that gets really ingrained in us. And I notice this because now I, I sort of actively talk about the fact that I sold my first book at 35 because I want people to understand that when we give advice to writers, it's not just for young writers. If you have a story to tell, unlike being you know, an Olympic athlete or an actor, you can do this at any age. You just have to have a good story and have the will to suffer and put it on the page. So um, for me, it was learning that structure and just saying, I'm not going to write a good book. I'm not going to write a perfect page. I'm going to write a terrible book, and maybe there will be something in it worth salvaging. Mm. I was 33 when the Night Circus came out. Bless. So, <laughs> and, those, and those lists of like five under 35, I was kind of like, I don't look at those anymore. I want one that's like 12 to watch under 60. Yep. <laughs> You'd be like, yes, five under 50. There you go. Like, where to go, me? So, you mentioned screenwriting. Yeah. And, uh, I, and I understand that there is going to be a Netflix adaptation. The <laughs> Grisha verse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how, how is how is that? How is seeing your baby in someone else's hands? It is both 
thrilling and totally maddening. Like it is, um, I, I'm very lucky because Eric Heiserer, who's our showrunner, um, is maybe one of the few good souls in Hollywood. No offense, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a genuinely good human. He's been very active in making sure that we not only cast diversely, but that we had a diverse writing room. Like he's, he doesn't just talk the talk. Um, and he actually cares about the relationship to the books. Um, and so he's involved me pretty deeply, um, especially in the scripts. I won't say that there haven't been fights. There absolutely have been. <laughs> um, and if anybody has met me, like I'm not somebody who um, is particularly good at diplomacy. Um, you know, when you're an author, it's you and the editor. There aren't 20 people in a room telling you how to tell a story. And I tend to believe that good stories are not written by committee. Um, and so, you know, occasionally I mouth off. <laughs> occasionally I'm like, angry email. Um, but for the most part, it's been a very good relationship. I think that the people involved with it really care about the story. Um, and I'll be honest, getting to see some of the costumes, like the costume design, the set design. We just did something called show and tell, where you walk like the executives through, um, you know, the sort of the inspiration pieces, the location. We're we're going to be shooting in Budapest in just less than two months. Have you been to Budapest? Yeah. I have not been to Budapest. And I never know whether to pronounce it Budapest or Budapest, because it sounds a little hipster. Pest. OK. It's like Melbourne or Melbourne. Like, how pretentious can you get? So, um, and I say very pretentious. but. Um, so it's been this extremely bizarre, wonderful process. I can tell you guys that the show is going to be, in some ways, radically different from the books, but in the biggest ways, I think in exciting ways, different from the books. So it's going to give you, essentially, like the most high-budget fanfic you've ever seen. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. So yeah, it's, it's exciting and horrifying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> For me, always like I have a he when I read a book, I have a head can, and you know somebody looks like this, a place looks like the costumes look like this, and then to actually see that on the screen, like does it match up? Do you need it to match up? Um, one of the things that's actually been both wonderful and a little bit disturbing is how quickly, like we've cast a few of the main roles, and how quickly those faces are now what I picture, Ooh. and I. And it actually gives me a certain sense of loss because I know now that once the show exists, it's going to erase headcanon for, you can't help it. It gets in your head. And, um, and I love these actors and I'm very thrilled with the choices we've made, but it is still a certain amount of grief mm -hmm. for, there's nothing like the reader's imagination and there's nothing like the writer's imagination. And I can't, like I'm not an artist, so it's not like I could have sketched that person, that person who was in my head is gone forever. So it's a little emotional, honestly. No, I didn't even Sorry, think about guys. that. No. <laughs> you, I, it's a death. I have more Kleenex. Do you want no mourners, no funerals, my butt. <laughs> <laughs> well, then let's change this up. Do you want another Kleenex? No, I'm good. Uh, OK. <laughs> Here, I can tell my weird adaptation story. Please, yes. Because the Night Circus was optioned like, before it even came out, and has now been, I believe they call it development hell. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> There's supposedly like movement on it. People have meetings and don't tell me about them. Like, um, okay, can we not tell anyone? I found out it had a director on Twitter. Oh no, um, that's not all right. That's not right. <laughs> uh, it, it's in fairness, I had told my agent, don't tell me anything unless it's important because I'm working on Star Wars stuff, and I don't know why he didn't think that counted as important. <laughs> But this is all I know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know anything. But I do know that about a, I lived in Salem, Massachusetts, when I wrote The Night Circus. And it sold in September of 2010. And Salem, of course, on Halloween is something else. So I would always go, and people watch. It's kind of like this with all the costumes. It's amazing. <laughs> and I, it's very, very crowded in downtown Salem on Halloween. So I was standing off to the side, like on like over this row of shops, and this woman next me big sunglasses is like chain smoking and just starts chatting to me and she's like oh what you do, what do you do and I was like oh well I'm a writer I actually just sold my first book and she looks at me and she goes you're gonna be big you're gonna be like Anne Rice big <laughs> there's gonna be a movie it's gonna have what do you call it beautiful cinematography uh, she was a psychic on her smoke break from <laughs> doing readings <laughs> in one of the stores in Salem. So I can, I, I feel safely, like I can safely say it, it will have, have beautiful <laughs> cinematography. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's all I know. laughs> 
Actually, that's funny because one of the, you know, when I was prepping for this and I looked at the panel description to see what people expected us to talk about, and one of the topics was astrology. Ah. <laughs> Which is like having a moment right now. My friends and I are always talking about like the mean things that CoStar says to us. CoStar is oh, so mean. Yeah, they don't have it for Android. Oh, yeah. well, I it's have okay. a sad song, so I don't, it, yeah. Today it told me not to get, not to let my feelings incapacitate me, which is like the nicest thing it said to me. <laughs> Weeks. <laughs> Dang. I know. I like tough love astrology. Yeah, but in a way, yeah, well, I don't know. Sometimes it's mean, but in a way, like, this tarot is very important in your books. And I was say, tarot shows yeah. up in, like, Ninth House and Star of the Sea yeah. and Ninth Circus. And, yeah. and what I, and I was thinking about ways that that was important in people's lives, and I was thinking about how it's almost like therapy if you can't afford a therapist, because it's a great mechanism for clarifying your thought process and listening to your inner voice. I use tarot cards sometimes when I'm writing. I'll just like pull something, like thinking it might spark an idea, and it does even if like the idea is, oh no, like <laughs> not that, <laughs> not that. Like I don't want that card. Um, you, you actually designed your own tarot deck. I did, and everyone always asks me if it like is going to be like published someday. Maybe when it gets to the top of the to-do list, because it never <laughs> manages to get to the top. Of the I'm just impressed by your stick to itiveness. I tried to do my own tarot deck, and I bogged down after about three cards. I was like, 78 of these, I can't. <laughs> no. I did them in like really small little acrylic paintings, mm -hmm. and I did like I would work on one, and it was sort of my way to like teach myself the tarot. Mm -hmm. And I think if I went back now, I'd probably do different things for different cards. Um, but it was a really good way for me to um, kind of like absorb the meaning and the ideas behind a single card and then put like bunnies on it. <laughs> <laughs> the bunnies are a thing in, uh, is, that, is that too much of a spoiler? No, there's bunnies. In there's the bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> there are also cats and owls and bees. Bees. Yep. bees. Lots of bees. I actually wanted to add, there is also an elaborate clock in one place, so, which made me think, does this exist in the same universe as, uh, as the Night Circus? Um, I'm going to say yes, and then afterwards I'm going to tell you a secret. <gasps> you yes! I love my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so both of you sort of write books that kind of, that are almost uncategorizable. I, the Grishaverse kind of gets pegged as YA, but I don't feel like it is. There's some romance elements, there's a couple of toes in speculative fiction and fantasy, and I feel like it's part of a larger blurring of genre lines that's happening now. Is that something you see? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I would place at least the Shadow and Bone trilogy pretty firmly in YA. Um, but I also think YA is not, it's a category, right? If you look at the, it's not a genre. So if you look at the YA shelf, there's such a wide variety of books there that it almost becomes a useless identifying you know, kind of head category. And I think for us, it became um, sort of shorthand for readers who were looking for a particular kind of pacing or who were looking for a particular kind of coming of age story. But I can speak um, and say that a huge number of my readers are adult. And I think there's been this thing in culture, this desire to say, oh, this is the infantilization of the reader. And this is, you know, there's always, whenever books written by women are popular, somebody will write a think piece about, um, you know, won't someone think about the ladies? Um, and, you know, how our brains have gone soft and soon our uteruses will fall out. But it's because science. It's actually 1850. It's just science. Yeah. So um, for Hysteria. me, there's been a sort of deep entrenchment in um, a, a willingness to say, yes, this is YA, and YA re is resonant for people because it, it is not so much about coming of age as about radical moments of transition and sort of the moment in your life when you come up against the world and you see how the world sees you and you have to reconcile who you are with that world. And I think that a lot of people, they change jobs, they get married, they get divorced, they have kids, they move to a different city, they're in a job where nobody sees their potential. Like, these are things that there's never a moment where you come of age and then you're just there. You have attained wisdom. You drink tea and dispense advice. Like, <laughs> That is actually my dream, is just to be everybody's witch aunt and sit on a porch and be like, behold my wisdom, give me candy. Um, <laughs> so it's like reverse Halloween. But, <laughs> but we, there's never a moment where we're fully become the person we're going to be. If you're the same person at, at 18, at 28 as you were at 18, something's wrong. If you're the same person at 38 as then as at 20, something is wrong. You're meant to keep evolving, and I think these stories speak to that. But I also knew with Ninth House, this was not a YA book. And you can read the first chapter and know it's not a YA book. So 
I have a genre blending question for Ninth House. Okay. Do we not like to use the H word? Horror? Yes. Horror! <laughs> well, there's definitely some horror. I haven't in there. seen people use the H word to describe it though, but I think yeah. it's definitely there. I you know what's funny is when I wrote it, I wasn't thinking that there were elements of horror in it, but I grew up reading a ton of horror, reading Stephen King, and mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of that in there. And I think for me, you can't, in writing about magic in the real world, there's inevitably going to be elements of horror because magic is dangerous. Magic is not kind, you know, especially in my books. It's not a gentle force, it's a commodity like anything else. And so if people are wielding it for their own ends, I think it's inevitable that there will be elements of horror in there. But yeah, it's in there. Yeah, because I like that. I like the like it has fa fantasy elements and horror elements and like all these sort of like genre things. And then people put that like people keep calling my stuff literary fantasy and I was like both of those terms mean like a lot of different things. Yeah. And you just stuck them together like yeah. to describe something. Yeah. I think people look for the tags that are going to be, oh, what's the thing that I like? Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely deeply rooted in fantasy, mm -hmm. but I think, I mean, I guess you, with Starless Sea, I think there's this, um, I would call it literary because mm -hmm. it's asking, it's not just the prose, it's asking the reader to trust the author in this way as you move through these stories within stories mm -hmm. that is, um, I think somebody who just wants a genre read, who yes. just wants fantasy, is going to be like, I don't get it. <laughs> uh, so you want to sort of prepare the reader. So I'm preparing you guys. There's a lot of horror in Ninth House. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be prepared. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, and it is, uh, there are elements of horror in the Grishaverse. There, you know, magic is, is dark and definitely scary in places. But this is kind of a departure for you. What made you, oh no, you're making a face at me. Did I ask the wrong question? No, no. <laughs> NPR people, we live in fear of asking the wrong question. No, please ask me the wrong question, always. <laughs> well, I just want to know, um, you, you, you have an established universe, and a lot of authors, when they establish a world and they put a lot of effort into it, and it's popular, and people are cosplaying their characters, they can play in that field for a long time. <laughs> Hi, I see, yeah, we see you over there. <laughs> you guys look good. Um, so why, uh, what made you step away? What made you do something different? I mean, I think, there are always, we're full of stories. I mean, that's very yeah. in keeping with the theme of the Starless Sea, but where there's the, I love the Grisha verse, and I think I will always go back there. And I think for my YA writing, that's where I've always seen it existing. Um, and I love writing secondary world fantasy. I think it allows us this sort of level of metaphor that is very different from what happens when we write an urban fantasy. That said, this was one of the first ideas I ever had. You know, when I signed with my agent long, long ago, um, you know, she said, "What else have you got?" And I said, "Well, this is this. I had this idea about the secret societies at Yale uh, really being repositories of ancient magic, and we didn't quite know where it fit. And you know, there were other stories I pitched to her: some horror, some others, some that became short stories later. Um, but I never thought that this that I was going to write." Now, I guess seven books, seven books in the same Don't universe. ask me to count, it's I Comic Con. <laughs> um, I never thought, I did not know it was going, how long the Grishaverse was gonna go or how many new paths I would discover in it. But those other stories have always been sitting with me and waiting to be told. It's just a question of having enough time to do it. And I had to carve out, to write Ninth House, um, I had to write it in between writing other books, which was quite challenging, because I really like to sink into a story. But you know, it was a few weeks here, a month or two there, you know, um, to be able to write this thing that I've wanted to write for so long. Um, I like the idea of sinking into a story, because I definitely had to do that with Starless Sea. That is a book that does ask you to trust that you're going somewhere in this sort of, that you're yeah. floating along on the sea. I thought I'd write something simple, and then I wrote a story with like six different books within the book and like many meta narratives and I mean it's literary in the best sense in that it's concerned with storytelling mm -hmm. and, and the preservation and the continuation of stories so how did that book come to you um, that was again like that was a space I had this sort of subterranean library kind of space in my head for a very long time there are actually like very very small bits of this book that I probably wrote 15 years ago mm -hmm. um, that like still survive there's like two pages that survived almost untouched from like way back and then there's stuff that I wrote like 
six months ago. Um, and they all sort of blend together. But I started with I wanted to write a book about books. And then as I got, I got more into the book about books, it sort of expanded and became more a book about stories and storytelling and how narratives work. And the thing that kind of broke it out in my brain was I kind of turned into more of a video game player than I used to be. <laughs> and I would just play endless hours, this is like 2014, 2015. I just did nothing but play Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, and that was sort of got me on these, just the idea of like, you can play and make certain decisions and have this version of the story, and you can play and make other decisions and have another sort of the story. And I was like, and I knew I couldn't do that in a novel, but I kind of wanted to try. So it kind of edges up over that choose your own adventure. Yeah. Kind of tone. Yeah. I, now, I, now I want to see a video game adaptation of oh this. Oh, my God. Like, amazing. Amazing. <laughs> really? <laughs> Is it going to happen? It, we talk about a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one last question, and then we'll turn it over to the lovely audience here, and I'll make you guys do my job for me. Um, one thing that I always like to ask people, especially in a place like this where origin stories are important, is what's your origin story? What set you, uh, like I always say for me when I was nine years old, my, it was the year 1984, I'm dating myself, my father handed me his college copy of 1984, that's my dad, and he said, here, I think you're ready for this. So I read it, and it warped my tiny mind because I had never read dystopia or speculative fiction or experienced world building, and I, that was the moment that like set my life path. Now I'm a professional nerd. So <laughs> what was it for you guys? Um, I mean, I can, I can point very specifically. I mean, there was certainly reading Swiftly T Tilting Planet. And there was this wonderful book called Cat Witch about a cat who wants to be a yes. witch. Do you know this book? know this book? Nobody knows this book. OK. <laughs> I'm going to talk. Um, <laughs> Which I loved. Um, so there, it's not that I wasn't aware of genre, but um, when I went to junior high, my whole life was in upheaval. I, my mom had remarried. We had moved to a very different part of town than the part of town I'd grown up in. I was in a new school. It was this all-girls school. And I really felt like I had landed on an alien planet. And um, I walked into the library, and some beautiful librarian had put a book of um, sci-fi and fantasy books out with a little sign that said, Discover New Worlds. Aww. And let me tell you, I really needed to discover new worlds, because the world I was living in felt small, and I did not belong in it at all. And the first book I picked up from that table was Dune. And <clears throat> there's a lot of negative things you can say about Dune. Kind of super racist and imperialist, for instance. But there's a lot of good things, too. And for me, I needed to get lost in a world where being brave and capable and tough and prepared was more important than being small and cute, um, which I wasn't. So this, for me, was um, the first book world I got lost in, really. And I think it set me on this path of being a genre reader and a genre writer. I'm trying to think. I have a terrible memory, so I'm just like, oh, yeah, things happened at some point in the past that got <laughs> me here. And I was trying to think, like, how far back, especially in, like, the, like, <clears throat> writing and the storytelling. And the one I always go back to is um, I used to read in, I like to read, like, literally, I want to close myself away with the book. I used to read Sitting in the Back of My Closet. I wrote this into the story. Let's see, there's a character yeah. who reads Sitting in the Back of His Closet. Um, and the one that, like, was very, very early and sort of made a huge impression on me that I do not remember the plot. I just remember elements. Um, is a book called Mail Order Wings by Beatrice Gormley. Mm. And it is, involves a girl who in, finds an ad in the back of a comic book. And the comic book is an adaptation of um, Kafka's The Metamorphosis. So I had my first <laughs> exposure to The Metamorphosis when I was like eight. Wow. Um, Seems about right. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's for, um, <clears throat> there's an ad in the back to send in and um, order wings in the mail and she sends in the little, she writes up the little thing and sends it in and gets these wings and she has to like individually put on the feathers and then like put like some sort of weird magic glue on her back and they work. And like that's sort of like, that's very much my aesthetic with that like it's magical that's like right there and it's right brushing up against the real world yeah. and it feels so close you could touch it. And yeah. I think that's kind of what got me here. And that and the fact that I was reading Stephen King when I was 12 and Harry Potter when I was 21. <laughs> 
I mean, I think fantasy readers are the people who, who never stop believing that they could send an ad away and mm. get their wings, that, that Narnia is waiting at the back of the yeah. wardrobe. You have to check the, mm -hmm. the it, back. It never goes away, that feeling. And I, would, I never want it to go away. And I feel like we're all in a special club of people who are like, we don't need to lose that part of ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, every night I go up the stairs to bed and there's a window at the top of the stairs and the moon comes in and I always try to drink the moonlight. You know, like in Madeline. I go. <laughs> Anyways, on that note. That was a little Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, okay, okay, fine. But I'm, you know, she's like, she's like licking that moon, moonlight icicle and I always think about that. Anyways, so it's time for you. We have about 15 minutes left. Our lovely audience to ask some questions. Ask so we have a microphone here. There's Come on up. Like we're waiting. We should do an ad for Blood Milk Jewelry because we're both wearing we quite, are. quite Blood a bit. We are. Blood Milk Jewelry. I noticed. own small business. Definitely. Go buy their stuff. <laughs> yeah. Hi, guys. Is this on? Yep. Yeah. yeah, it is on. I'm a picture book author, but I am looking to uh, start writing middle grade novels. And I heard you say, Lee, you're a plotter and Aaron, you're a pantser. But when you have a general structure, do you layer things, is a process question, do you layer stuff on in a certain way, like you focus on dialogue, then you focus on character development, or is there any process beyond plotting that you can share? I mean, again, everybody's process is different. I can say that I start with plot, um, and I write what's called a fast draft. There's usually chunks of dialogue, chunks of description, but a ton of placeholders. And to give you an idea, the fast draft of Six of Crows was 30,000 words, and the final draft was 130,000 words. So I start with that so that I have essentially an incredibly elaborate outline, and then I go back and start putting more and more in as I build the book, but everybody and is different. I do the opposite because I just I'll write full scenes, I'll do a description and dialogue and go on and on for pages and pages, and I'll just layer them on and layer them on, and then do like I'll keep this one, I'll throw this one away, and kind of put, like puzzle piece it together in that way. Yeah, you just have to find your own way. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, The Language of Thorns was my introduction to the Grissiverse, and I was wondering how that came about. Um, I, yeah, uh, so The Language of Thorns is a book of illustrated dark fairy tales. Um, they're the stories that my characters would have heard when they were children. Um, and really, it began with The Witch of Duva. It was the first story written in that book, and it was written because um, I was approached by Tor.com to write uh, like a prequel story for Shadow and Bone, to introduce readers to Shadow and Bone, and I didn't want to write a prequel. The book already has a prologue, and for me, that book was completely intact. It didn't need a prequel. Um, and so I started thinking, I was always obsessed with Hansel and Gretel. I think it's one of the worst stories ever, not because of The Witch, pro witch, um, <laughs> but because they go back to their father at the end. Uh, their father who sent them into the woods to die twice. And you can say, oh, it was the stepmother, but dad was just like, seems like a good idea. <laughs> um, and for me, there was such, even as a kid, this sense of tremendous peril in that, like that, that was the happy ending, terrified me um, because they were not going back into safety. And so I wanted to upend that story. So every story in that book is about when you're reading a fairy tale, those moments where part of you is like, eh, and you just leave it because you're used to leading stuff or fairy tale and sort of skipping over it to make the fairy tale work. And instead of skipping over it, sort of sinking into the parts where the story doesn't feel right. Yeah. I love the Little Mermaid adaptation at the end. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's probably one of the darker things I've written, so thank you. <laughs> I like dark. Hi. Uh, Hi. First, I just want to say thanks. Uh, I feel like you talking about writing made me feel like I could try starting to write again after this. So. You should do it. Thank you. Um, so my question was, and I should say I've only read the original Grisha trilogy, so if this is lonely beyond that, sorry. But uh, I was wondering how you sort of approached like class and elitism when you were writing, because like, like in the Grisha trilogy, in the Shadow and Bone trilogy, like the ruling family are sort of like corrupt and the bad. Mm -hmm. They're you know they're kind of awful, and like so you're always sort of like sympathetic that like oh maybe overthrowing them isn't the worst idea but then like Nikolai is sort of like fantastic and awesome and he like invents flying machines and like new farming techniques and he's like the greatest guy so I guess I was wondering when you went into this did you when you went into the trilogy did you think about like what you were saying about like rich powerful people and like whether they are a positive or a negative force um I mean I think this is a good question for both of us really in terms of message versus story um I think that for me I thought about this a lot because when I was writing Ninth House, the vision I had of it as a story really changed 
from the conception of it to the actual sitting down and writing of it. And I think that's because, you know, when I set out to write Six of Crows, I was like, oh, I'm gonna write a magical heist. Wouldn't that be fun? It'll be a romp. <laughs> Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, a young boy is floating down the river on his brother's bloated corpse. So, <laughs> so, but the truth is, if you want to write a story about thugs and thieves, then you have to ask. If you're going to explore the world honestly as a storyteller and thoroughly as a storyteller, then you have to ask what forces created those thugs and thieves. If you want to write a story about power in a, a, a world that resembles imperialist Russia, then you have to ask what class forces are at work there and what it means for a country that has never experienced democracy or anything close to it um, and where conscription of, of, of soldiers is a real thing and where the failure to industrialize is a real thing. You know, Why is this country isolated? Why do they need an army full of magic users? Um, what does the, the rise of modern warfare mean for them? And with Ninth House, I was like, oh, won't it be fun to write magic among the secret societies at Yale? But you cannot write a book about an institution like Yale without addressing privilege. And you can't write a book about being a young undergraduate woman in one of these institutions without addressing classism, racism, gender, assault, because that is what the real world is. So for me, it's less about having a message when I begin than being honest about the story I'm telling. I always like to think of that as like the butterfly effect, where like if you're going to do one thing, what else does it affect around it and yeah. in the world and the plot and the characters? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> He's like, that's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, actually, two questions. Are you going to have books at the signing? To we buy? will both have books for sale at the signing. I think we need things to sign. So yes, okay. we will happily Probably. sign them. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Now my real question is, um, you have that series coming up on Netflix. Are you going to have any kind of cameo in it? That's my question. I, she asked if I was going to have a cameo in the Netflix show. I have explicitly asked them if I could die horribly. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I just want to be like, ah! like yeah, I'm good. I'm good, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I have asked, and I, I, when I met our costume designer, and she showed me some of the fabrics for the keftas, I was like, can I please have one? <laughs> like, yeah. She said yes, but we'll see what happens. So fingers crossed. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you. I'm going to keep her trend. It's about the adaptation again, if that's okay. all right. Um, I have read both The Shadow and Bone and The Six of Crows. Six of Crows is admittedly a firm favorite. That's fair. I'm just wondering, <laughs> percentage-wise, I know it's like fan fiction on crack, but percentage-wise, how much... 50-50. It's 50-50. It's 50-50. Yeah. Look, y'all, I know it sounds nuts, right? It you can't does. take Shadow Moan and Six of Crows and mush it together. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we can, and we did, and it's so much fun. And look, we're still fine-tuning the scripts. This happens all the way up to shooting and probably during shooting. So I'm not making any guarantees because, again, like there are definitely like push and pull. But the stuff that we pitched and that we worked on and that I saw come out of the writer's room is so fun. And it's so delicious. And you will get, and what we, we wanted this to be, we wanted to tell the story of the whole world, the whole world, like the whole Grishaverse. Um, and it felt limiting to stay in one. So I think it works brilliantly. So just trust us for now. All the faith. Okay. <laughs> All the faith. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is also has to do with the Six of Crows series. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's so okay. good. No, it's exciting. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, when you wrote it, was there an intentional association between the kind of the characters and their personalities and the countries from which they hail? Like you see Novia Zem is supposed to be this kind of... Um, pioneer, like uncharted, and you see a lot of that in all the characters who come from it. Jesper is this like wild, you know, rootin' tootin', uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, rootin' tootin', pistol shootin'. Uh, He's like the <laughs> ready. Of <laughs> um, and I just wanted to know if there was um, a purposeful like tie between the characters and from the cultures that they come from. I think that that's inevitable. If you're going to think, again, thoroughly about a character, then the place they were raised and how they were raised, not just in terms of, like, what were their parents like? Like, one of my great joys in writing that series was writing Jesper's father, because I had killed off so many parents, and because there were so he's many... so pure. He's so pure, and, and, and actually, I, it, it, he was somewhat inspired because one of my favorite characters in fiction is Brimstone from um, Lainey Taylor's trilogy. <laughs> 
like, I love him, and I'm, no spoilers, but like, my heart. Um, and I really wanted to show like a positive parental relationship. So culture, family, all of that has to, you, like, of course it influences you, and there are the things we, like, Matthias cannot sca escape the culture he was raised in, you know, and I think a lot of people get that. You know, I came from a very conservative household. Um, you know, I still have very conservative relatives. You know, like there's um, there's some of that in all of them, and also what you choose to take from your culture and hold dear to you, like Inej, and what you choose to push away and and reject, like Matthias. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, sorry to all of you waiting faithfully in line. We only have time for one more question. And that's, that's you. you. That's you. And quite no. frankly, you deserve it because yeah. you look like fabulous. a beautiful yeah. angel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to preface this by saying um, I read The Night Circus like a million times. Whenever those like security questions ask what your favorite book is, it's always The Night Circus. Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your mother's maiden name? <laughs> Um, so the thing that I was wondering is um, your book has so many different characters in it, and obviously, you know, you've got Celia and Marco, but then you've got Tante Padva and Poppet and all <clears> these, um, I don't really want to say secondary characters, but even with all the characters outside of the two main protagonists, you do such an amazing job of building them up and giving them origin stories and making them really fully fleshed out 3D people. And I was wondering, um, what's your process for character building? How do you sort of get them from, you know, this is like a 2D character with this one motivation to the people that they are in your book? I think sometimes they just show up in my head and they're people. Like, and, like, and I think there are so many characters in the same thing with Star Wars They're both very much ensemble pieces. Like you have your like more prominent characters and your secondary characters. But I always want to do that idea. It's in the Night Circus. It's that like the, your story is part of your sister's story is part of like many other stories. And I wanted it to. I always wanted to feel like you could be following any one of these people and be getting just as much of a rich narrative. So you kind of have to do well what is going on with them, what do they want, even if you don't see them that much. And that's when it helps when I, like, I just keep drafting a lot. So you see all those other things around the edges. And I just thinking like, that they're not there to serve a purpose. They're there to have a full life, even though um, I did originally when I didn't know, because not a planner. Um, <laughs> I, Marco came about as a character in a very early draft because I knew Sean Dresch would not be taking his own notes. And I needed someone in that room to write things down. And there he was. And I did not know he was going to be so important at the time. <laughs> but I like to follow and see how everyone develops. And, like, and I do, I will go into, there is a, um, there is a character in the story of Sea who is briefly mentioned, and that's it. And I probably have 10,000 words that I wrote about her backstory. And she ended up being a sentence. Okay. Oh, but I think it's worth going into that and really kind of like letting yourself feel that these, are, these aren't just characters, these are people. I feel like it's almost the same process as research. Mm. You know, like you research, 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 and you'll pull one tiny thing from yeah. those chapters and chapters of research, and then you'll find some other thing that suddenly becomes important to the story. Like it is, I think it's always a process of exploration. Yep. Yeah. Thank well, thank you, you very much. Um, where can these, before we go, where can these nice people see you and get books signed? We are signing right They're now. They're going to send us to a place. To a place. To sign things place. with pens. Table 7. Autograph at, area. In the sales field. In the sales pavilion. And then to Saturday, I will be signing at the Macmillan booth. And, and I will be signing at the Penguin Random House booth tomorrow at 1 and Saturday at 10.30. And both of those events are ticketed that you get tickets at the booth in the first thing in the morning. Thank okay. you all. You're lovely people. Hey, Petra. Hi. Thank you.